Um, it's a really great pleasure to speak to all of you tonight. I'm uh, a little bit uh, surprised at the turnout, so it's obviously a, a topical um, subject that people are interested in, and I'll do my absolute best to uh, entertain you and convey uh, some good information over the next hour. We are streaming this live uh, on the web. We've got another room full of people next door uh, who've uh, also ventured out this evening, which is why we really wanted to get the, the live streaming happening. Uh, have many close colleagues uh, here from overseas and from Hobart. Uh, it's wonderful to have them here. They can help me with all the tricky questions at the end. Um, uh, but let's get going. The world we live in at the moment, if you look at the, the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report, it gives a, 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 a comprehensive overview of the observed climate changes that we've been seeing around the world. And I'm going to focus particularly here, as the, in my introductory comments, on the changes in the cryosphere. And we define the cryosphere as those parts of the Earth's surface that are covered with ice. And ice takes many different forms. We know that the Antarctic ice sheet, which is the, the enormous ice sheet uh, down on top of the, the South Pole, it contains about 70% of the world's fresh water, and we know that it's slowly melting, particularly in West Antarctica, and combined with the changes that are happening in the Greenland ice sheet in the Northern Hemisphere, contributing about one to two millimeters of sea level rise per year. We know also that the permafrost, uh, which again is mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the temperature of that over the last 20 to 30 years has increased by several degrees, and the active layer thickness, and we define that as the, uh, the, the depth to which thawing of the permafrost takes place each year, that's actually increasing over the last 30 years, which means there's uh, more, more temperature getting down deeper into the earth and melting that, more, uh, that permafrost. We know from satellite remote sensing over the last 40 or 50 years that there's been significant changes to the annual snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere. Ice shelves around both Greenland and the Antarctic are continuing to uh, melt. We know from work that was done just this last summer by the ACRC, we got the Aurora Australis right down to the Totten Glacier. It's one of those glaciers around the world that um, is showing about a metre per year um, lowering of surface elevation, and we're trying to understand what's behind that. We know also from work done by this institute that the Southern Ocean has been warming significantly over the last several decades. The very first um, round of funding for the ACRC was in 1991. Uh, we took a, a ship to Antarctica that year. We stopped every 30 miles along the way to Antarctica and took measurements of ocean temperature from the surface right down um, to the depths, and we've repeated that six times in the last 25 years. And every time we've gone back, we can see that the temperature in the Southern Ocean is warming ever so slightly each time. So it's a sustained uh, warming that we've seen in the Southern Ocean. We know that mountain glaciers around the world are also contributing to sea level rise. They're shrinking. We know that from satellite observations and field observations. And we know that Arctic sea ice has also declined very significantly. So why is it that Antarctic sea ice extent is actually increasing? I know that's why you're all here tonight, to, uh, to try and uh, hear some answers to that question. But I think it's important that the question is framed in the context of many, many other significant changes that are happening. So tonight's presentation, I think it's important to talk about sea ice as a material. So I'll give you a quick overview about what is sea ice. I'll talk about why it's important, why we should care about it, certainly why scientists care about it, why our logistics and operations managers care about it. And then I'll talk to you a little bit more about why it's changing and what the impacts of some of those changes are. There are a lot of people that have contributed to this presentation. And this is, these are 14 of my colleagues. They're all based in Hobart. They all work on different aspects of sea ice. They're either employed by the ACRC or our partners at the Antarctic Division, the Bureau of Meteorology, and the University of Tasmania. And they're all a very, very committed bunch of people. Most of them are here tonight. 
and um, uh, without all of their efforts, I, I wouldn't be standing here uh, giving this presentation. We're also lucky enough to have some close colleagues from overseas with us tonight. Um, they are the leaders in their field without question, and um, it's, it's wonderful to have them here. So what is sea ice? I've just put up six photographs and I'll work from top to bottom, left to right, and, and talk a little bit about the formation processes of sea ice. It's frozen seawater for a start. It forms on the surface of the ocean around Antarctica and also across the surface of the Arctic Ocean. It starts to form in late summer, extends all through autumn and winter and reaches a maximum extent in spring. And it can take many forms. For those of us who are lucky enough to have been there or worked there or, or transit to Antarctica, uh, the most magical thing is just to go and see the various shapes and forms of the sea ice as you're moving through in the icebreaker. This is um, what's called pancake ice. It's tiny little pancakes of ice, only 10 or so centimetres thick. And when there's uh, a wavy environment, that ice uh, um, uh, just dampens the waves down and creates quite a spectacular vista. Um, slowly but surely, the ice thickens to form something like this. These ice flows are tens of metres across. They start to accumulate a snow cover. Eventually, those flows all bond together and you get um, uh, a much more consolidated um, ice cover, which is shown in the bottom left. Uh, that consolidated ice cover is still going to move around with wind and waves and, and ocean currents, and that's when these cracks uh, form. And, uh, and eventually refreeze. We also, eventually it gets to, to a thickness where we can go out and work on it. Um, this is an average day in the office for sea ice scientists when they're down south. And of course, sea ice can be a fantastic um, uh, benefit when you're resupplying Antarctic stations because the ice close to Davis Station, for example, where this photograph was taken, is about two metres thick. It's quite level at the surface and you can just un unload your cargo straight off the ship onto the ice and drive it away. So there are times when sea ice is actually a great benefit to our logistics operators as well as a hindrance. A few important uh, points that we uh, have to agree on before, uh, before we go any further. And I just mentioned these because it's very easy um, uh, to, to use terminology or, or language that uh, isn't understood by everybody. And it's important we're all on the same page. Um, sea ice is frozen seawater. Um, it's, it's, uh, it forms every year. Uh, around Antarctica and on the Arctic Ocean, as I said. Most of it is less than two metres thick. In exceptional circumstances, it can get up to 10 or 20 metres thick, and most of it melts every summer. Um, it's distinctly different to the continental ice that sits on the Antarctic ice cap, and it's distinctly different to icebergs, which are the, um, the large pieces of ice that, that break off, off Antarctica. And I've just shown a photo here for some scale um, I prefer to go to Antarctica in a large red ship. Some people like to sail down. I think you might feel quite vulnerable on a, on a windy, nasty day um, surrounded by icebergs like that. Scale is also very important in Antarctica. Um, Australia is about 7.6 million square kilometres in area, and Antarctica is about double that, almost double that. And so this is the South Pole about here, if you're looking at the map of Antarctica, and it extends out uh, over this area, which is the, the outer shape here is the coastline of Antarctica. On top of that 14 million square kilometres, you then have to add another 20 million square kilometres of ice. And the figure on the right here shows the maximum extent of sea ice around Antarctica in September of each year. It shrinks back to about this amount in February. Um, and the difference here is from about three or four million square kilometers of sea ice around the coast out to about 20 million. So when you add the 14 million square kilometers of the Antarctic ice cap to the 20 million square kilometers of sea ice, you get this vast area of the Southern hemisphere that's covered by ice um, in September of each year. And this change from minimum extent to maximum extent is one of the greatest seasonal changes that happens anywhere on the surface of the Earth. And this shows 
the evolution of that ice cap, sorry, of, of the sea ice. You can see the outline of the map of Antarctica here. This is a composite of satellite images that's been put together by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in the US. You can see we're just about to pass uh, the, um, the middle of uh, the winter or the winter um, uh, solstice. And the sea ice extent just continues to increase you can see how it's moving around the edge as uh, weather systems and pressure systems continue to move the ice out. And when it reaches its maximum extent, which is about um, uh, late September, there it is. And this red line, that red line um, is the, the, uh, the long-term mean. So the mean sea ice extent from 1980 to, um, to recently, and you saw roughly where the, um, the, the maximum extent for last year sits relative to that. Now, why is all this important? Just a couple of slides that I think are important to convey um, some important information. And that is when you form sea ice, you turn the surface of the ocean from a very dark color to a much lighter color. So without sea ice, when the sun shines, most of that energy or heat goes into the ocean. When we talk about um, uh, global warming or atmospheric warming, uh, most of that heat ultimately ends up in the ocean. But when you form sea ice, uh, most of it's reflected back into space and only a small amount of it ends up in the ocean. Sea ice is also a major driver of ocean circulation. When sea ice forms, um, it's not as salty as the water that it forms from. So average seawater is about 33 parts per thousand salinity and the sea ice ends up being somewhere around five to 10. And all of that salt, which isn't in the ice, ends up in the surface of the ocean. It makes the surface of the ocean more dense. That dense water sinks and that's what happens here. Sea ice forms around Antarctica, the surface water sinks and eventually it mixes with water on the continental shelf and it flows right to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, this water continues to extend northward and in its place this warmer water comes up from, from deep in the ocean and comes to the surface. This water of course is also low in oxygen, it comes to the surface, it replenishes itself in oxygen and so this circulation is not only uh, an important part of the climate system by which heat is moved around the world, it's also important for the health of the oceans. And I've got a little schematic here I'd like to show you. This is often called the ocean conveyor belt, the global ocean circulation. The red lines on here show the surface currents. Uh, it's obviously simplified, but it gives you a good idea. The Southern Ocean around Antarctica is the only belt of latitude where um, you can uh, circumnavigate the entire globe uninterrupted by land. And because there are westerly winds blowing constantly, there's this enormous ocean current just constantly circling from west to east around Antarctica. Now, I'm going to show um, what might happen to some water in that Southern Ocean current. If we take some surface water here, uh, it, it, uh, with the formation of sea ice, it will sink, it will turn into a deep water current, and it may end up in the northern part of the Indian Ocean. Or alternatively, it may end up right up in the northern part of this Pacific Ocean. And similarly, we get this surface water that can flow right up into the high Arctic, into the North Atlantic. Because of sea ice formation, that surface water will sink, and then it will ultimately come all the way back down to the Southern Ocean. And where these red lines and blue lines connect, in other words, where the surface water and the deep water are connected by vertical circulation, it's around Antarctica and it's in the Arctic Ocean and it's sea ice formation that drives that process. The other reason sea ice is important, and this is my last introductory slide, is because it's an important habitat for wildlife. Um, if you were a penguin trying to escape from a leopard seal or an orca, um, this is a pretty good place to be. Um, but not only is it an important habitat, uh, for what we call charismatic megafauna. It's also an important habitat for the things that you don't uh, see or that aren't quite as sexy when you're taking photographs. Uh, on the bottom of the ice, we see these algal communities. They, uh, they get trapped in the ice, they thrive in the ice, 
when the ice melts in the springtime, um, uh, all of that algae gets released into the surface ocean, and that's one of the things that drives primary production uh, and, again, the health of the oceans. It provides a great food source for krill. And a little bit later in the um, seminar, I've got a, a movie to, to show you of, of some of that. So, Antarctic sea ice. This is what you all came to, to see, the, the plots that you came to see. Um, and this is how it's changed over the last, say, 35 years, from 1979 through to 2014. Now, why do we start at 1979? It's because this is when the first satellites were launched by NASA that enable us to um, observe daily global sea ice extent. And, uh, and we've been able, uh, around Antarctica and the Arctic, to monitor that um, ever, ever since. And this shows the minimum extent, which is either in February or March each year, and the maximum extent around Antarctica. Uh, we can see the minimum extent, so this is, uh, this is these two things go together. At minimum extent, there's been a slight trend of about 1% per decade, and at maximum extent, we've seen a trend of about 1.2% per decade. This is in large contrast to what's happened in the Arctic. If you look, and this is now maximum extent in the Arctic, which occurs in March, uh, we've seen a decline over the last 35 years of uh, about 3.5% per decade. And if you look at the minimum extent in the Arctic, which occurs in September, the decline has been much more significant. We're talking about declines of about 13% per decade over that same period. And this um, difference between what's happening in the Arctic and what's happening in the Antarctic uh, has been one of the uh, possibly most public uh, discussions about what's, what's happening in the cryosphere and what the impacts of climate change are. Now, I've put four little circles up here because just recently, we've seen a number of records. Um, let's look at the Antarctic first. This is maximum uh, extent around Antarctica in September, and the most sea ice we've ever seen around Antarctica happened on the 19th of September last year, and it nudged just over 20 million square kilometres for the first time. Around uh, the minimum, uh, you can see this is incredibly variable uh, from one year to the next, but the last couple of years we've seen a, uh, a minimum, uh, a, a record minimum extent, if, if that makes sense. And in the Arctic, we've seen similar challenges. Uh, for maximum extent here in March, um, I shouldn't have said challenges, we've seen uh, similar observations. Uh, in uh, maximum Arctic extent here, uh, there was a new record set only a couple of months ago when the maximum extent was the lowest on record. And similarly, uh, in the Arctic, just a couple of years ago, we saw the lowest uh, extent ever on record. So let's talk a little bit about why. I want to start by talking about the climate models because the climate models didn't get it right when we look at Antarctic sea ice. This is a, a, a fairly messy plot that shows what the various climate models that contribute to the IPCC report showed, um, uh, well, what they thought would happen with Antarctic sea ice. And you can see in January, February, March, which is summer, there was this enormous scatter in prediction, but most of them predicted a significant decline. So zero would have meant you, it stayed the same. Uh, a negative number here means the models ex um, predicted that there would be a decline in sea ice extent. So most of them predicted a significant decline here. And then most of them through the, uh, the winter months and into spring and maximum extent is September. They all converged, but they still all showed that they would expect to see less sea ice at that time of year. So they converged, but they were all wrong. Now, why is that? Well, uh, at, the, at the macro level, I guess, it's very clear that the pr processes that are responsible for driving the sea ice edge 
uh, aren't properly captured in those models. Um, but in the defense of the modelers, sea ice is absolutely one of the hardest things to get right. When we talk about climate models, we're actually talking about a collection of models that all have to come together. We take an ocean model, we take an atmosphere model, we take a land surface model, and they all have to get put together. The challenge with sea ice is it sits right at the interface between an ocean model and an atmosphere model. And it's hard enough to get those models to talk to each other under normal circumstances, but when you put sea ice in the way, everything gets enormously complicated. And so I think one thing that we've learned out of this is that the climate models need to do a better job. But we need more observations to validate those models, and we also uh, have to ensure that a lot of the processes which happen at smaller scales than the resolution of the model also have to be captured, and that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, this is what the models showed, and this is for IPCC 4, so this is the fifth assessment report, this is the fourth assessment report, and this is for the Arctic. Um, it's a messy plot, but this red line is the actual observations from satellite of what has happened to Arctic sea ice uh, over the satellite period and a bit before. There's uh, other field observations that have also been contributed in there. And all of this mess here is the, um, the different uh, models and, and the model runs that contributed uh, to the uh, IPCC assessment report. And the black line here is the ensemble mean, so just the average of all of those model runs. And you can see it doesn't get the red line, but it does show a decline. And so while the climate models for the Antarctic didn't do um, a very good job at all, uh, at least in the Arctic, the models do show that there should have been a decline, but of course the observed decline was significantly more than the models predicted. So um, the scorecard, probably a 5 or 6 out of 10 for the climate models in the Arctic and a 0 out of 10 in the Antarctic. So let's talk a little bit now about what drives Antarctic sea ice extent. And I'm going to talk about three things, and they're all very important. The first is geography. This is an image of the Arctic. You can see this is the, the North Pole would be about here, and the North Pole is an ocean. Well, the Arctic Ocean uh, covers the North Pole, and the sea ice that forms in this area um, covers the very northernmost uh, latitude. This is the Greenland ice cap here, just so you've got your your bearings. Um, this is uh, northern part of Scandinavia, uh, this is Russia, this is Canada, uh, this is Alaska just here. So uh, you can see that the Arctic Ocean is landlocked. The sea ice that forms in the northern hemisphere on the Arctic Ocean is entirely constrained by land all around it. In the Antarctic, it's completely the opposite. The South Pole is about here, and there's a continent with rock and about four kilometers of ice sitting on top, which is the Antarctic continent. And all of the sea ice exists around the edge. So it's at a much higher, sorry, a much lower latitude um, uh, to start with, and it's completely unconstrained at its northern edge. So if the wind wants to blow it north, and I'm about to show you that that's one of the things that happens, then it's not constrained by land and it can be blown north in response to the wind. So let's talk about the wind. This is a map that shows the Arctic basin on the left-hand side and the Antarctic on the right-hand side. And um, again, it's a little bit messy, but the blue arrows show the wind field for the Arctic Ocean and for the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. The gray here is the maximum sea ice extent. The blue shows the arrows and the direction of the wind. And you can see a, a, an arrow this size is five kilometers per day in the Arctic and 10 kilometers per day in the Antarctic. So um, it's actually much more windy in Antarctica than it is in the Arctic. And when you blow uh, wind in a, um, 
uh, a cyclonic movement in the, in the uh, southern hemisphere, it's always going to have a northerly component. It's called the Coriolis eff effect, and it's because of the, um, the rotation of the Earth. So if you blow wind in this direction, because of the rotation of the Earth, you're actually going to get a little bit of northward variation. And you can see that here a little bit, uh, and you can see it uh, up through here around the Weddell Sea. Uh, there are places around the coast where uh, there are various features that, um, that drive uh, ice and wind in a particular direction. But what you can see is where you get these wind, winds blowing away from the coast, it pretty well matches the outline of the uh, sea ice. The same is true around here. And where you have arrows along the coast or where you have uh, weaker winds, uh, the sea ice doesn't extend nearly as far. And in the Arctic Ocean, you get a very similar thing. You get this cyclonic gyre in the Arctic. A little bit of ice uh, escapes through the Bering Sea. Most of it comes out here uh, to the, the northeastern side of Greenland. Uh, but again, it's very constrained compared to the Antarctic. The numbers that you can just see around here show the trends by region. So when I said before, there's been a trend of about 1.2% overall for the whole of the Antarctic, but when you look by region, you can see it's about 1.3% here, so about the same as the average, uh, a little bit more in this sector, about the average here, but significantly more here and significantly less here. And I'll talk a little bit about why we're seeing regional variations in a minute. Uh, interestingly, all throughout the Arctic basin, um, there's negative numbers, so it doesn't matter really how you slice and dice the Arctic Ocean. Uh, there's a negative trend, with the one exception, just west and south of Alaska, there's increasing sea ice over the last little while. And the main reason for that is because they've been having anomalously cold winters and they've been having anomalously um, strong northerly winds, which have been pushing ice south of the Bering um, Sea and seeing uh, an increase in ice extent there. So that's wind, but why is the wind changing? So as with most good scientific questions, you, you answer one, but then you need to know what's going on. We can see that ice is driving or being driven by wind and changes in wind around Antarctica, but what is driving the changes in wind? And there's a few things that, uh, uh, that are driving those changes. Uh, we know from observations that the westerly winds that blow around Antarctica are increasing and they've increased by about 20% over the last several decades. We know that from observations. We also know, and it's been very well publicised, I'd be amazed if anyone in the room wasn't aware that we've had a depletion of the ozone in the stratosphere. Um, it was caused by putting chlorofluorocarbons into the uh, stratosphere and it causes what we know is the ozone hole over Antarctica. And this is just a little schematic that shows that. For those of you that live in Hobart, you know that you get sunburnt much more readily here than if you go to Sydney or Brisbane, even if it's hotter in Sydney or Brisbane. And it's because more radiation is reaching the surface and that's because there's less ozone, even at the latitude of Hobart. So ozone depletion in the stratosphere, it's about 20 or 30 kilometers above the surface, and it's caused a cooling of the stratosphere. Now, why has it cooled? It's because ozone absorbs radiation from the sun. And so if you've got ozone in the stratosphere, it's absorbing that radiation and it's going to warm the stratosphere up. Uh, when you've got less ozone, you're absorbing less radiation, and so the stratosphere has cooled. Now, if you cool the stratosphere, uh, but the temperature closer to the equator stays the same, then you end up with this stronger temperature gradient between um, high latitudes over Antarctica and lower latitudes uh, closer to the equator. And when you've got that stronger temperature gradient, you're going to uh, strengthen what's called the polar vortex. So the winds in the upper part of the atmosphere strengthen and eventually that signal propagates down to the surface and it's realized as stronger westerly winds around Antarctica. Exactly the same thing happens with increasing greenhouse gases. Uh, we know we're seeing an increase in CO2 globally, including in the Southern Ocean. Uh, it's 
pumped into the atmosphere at the troposphere, but that CO2 also rises into the stratosphere and it has the same effect uh, as decreasing ozone, which is you put more CO2 there and you cool the stratosphere. Now, these two things actually, um, sometimes they work together and eventually they will cancel each other out or at least work in opposite directions. This is a bit of a um, complicated slide, but bear with me. This temperature gradient that I was talking about between the upper atmosphere over Antarctica and the, uh, the say, the equatorial regions, that's what scientists call the southern annular mode. But just think of it as a difference in pressure between two points. When you uh, have a, a stronger gradient, we call that a positive phase of this pressure difference. And that's shown by this gray area here. The take home message from this plot is that this gray area here, when it's above zero, it means the westerly winds around Antarctica will be more compressed towards Antarctica. And if it was below zero, it means that belt of stronger westerly winds would be more towards the north. And so we'd actually have windier conditions in Tasmania, for example. So this belt of, of stronger winds actually moves north and south with the seasons, but there's also a longer term time scale on which it moves north and south. At the moment, it's stuck in this mode where the stronger westerly winds are down towards Antarctica. That's great when you're having a barbecue in Hobart, although you wouldn't have known it from some of the, the windy days we've had lately. Um, but it does mean that the stronger westerly winds are more to the south. And part of that's been driven by um, ozone. From, this is from 1970 to 2010. The depletion of ozone in the atmosphere is one of the things that has driven those stronger westerly winds. Because ozone is now recovering, and this is model data beyond 2010, the ozone will slowly recover. And this uh, positive phase, you can see here it's it's always above zero, and as it would move down here, it, you would see it relax. So sometimes it's above zero, sometimes it's not. And that means almost certainly if you just look at the ozone, then there's going to be a slackening of winds around Antarctica some point in the next 50 to 70 years. Now, the greenhouse gases are a different story. They've got off to a, a slow start here. But you can see there's no reversing trend at 2010. They actually continue to increase and continue to increase um, right out to 2100 and beyond. Of course, we don't know what emission scenarios we're ultimately going to be looking at uh, in terms of CO2 concentrations. But as the, the business as usual, um, th this will continue to increase. And, and so this greenhouse gas component of this story means that this gray area continues always to remain above zero. And so that means the stronger westerly winds would be closer to Antarctica, um, but would be canceled or offset somewhat by the recovery of ozone. I hope that made sense. It's, um, it's not, the, not the easiest part of this talk to explain. The best way to summarize this is to look at the trends in wind over the last um, 18 years, and this is some work done by our colleagues uh, in the US, this plot on the right hand side um, shows the average pressure trends around Antarctica over an 18 year period. So it's important to think this is the trend. This is, this is what's changed over the last 18 years. And just as you have high and low pressure systems crossing the Southern Ocean and crossing Tasmania and affecting our weather, there's also low and high pressure systems around uh, the, the coastline of Antarctica, but this is the average. So on average, there's lower pressure in this region than there is here and lower pressure in this region than there is here. Where these black arrows appear, that shows where there's been a, a significant trend, a statistically significant trend over the last 20 years. And you can see there's been an increase in southerly winds from off the Ross Ice Shelf. You can see that there's been an increase in northerly winds to this area west of the Antarctic Peninsula. 
an increase in northerly winds here uh, and around this low pressure system here, northerly winds coming in which are warmer, they're moist, uh, they bring warmer air into this part of the coast and they push colder southerly air there. This little figure on the left hand side shows the, the changes in sea ice extent around Antarctica for the same period. And where there's red, it means that there's um, a significantly shorter sea ice season now than there was um, 20 or 30 years ago. And where there's blue, it means there's significantly more ice now than there was 20 or 30 years ago. And not surprisingly, where we see these strong northerly winds here, we're also seeing a big reduction in sea ice. Where we're seeing stronger southerly winds here, we're seeing a big increase in sea ice. And these changes happen for two reasons. One is temperature and one is wind. Um, you know, again, being based in the Southern Ocean, uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, um, when we have uh, northerly winds in Tasmania, they tend to be warmer than when we have southerly winds. And exactly the same logic applies in Antarctica. When the wind is coming in from the north, it's maritime air, it's been warmed by the ocean, and it's more likely to melt sea ice uh, when it hits it, but it's also more likely to compact the ice. The ice is highly mobile and it gets pushed around by wind very, very easily, and this ice is getting pushed right up against the coast here, and so the ice extent in this area is being pushed south. Quite the opposite is happening here. You've got much colder wind coming off the Antarctic continent. It's pushing the ice north, and also because it's cold, as it pushes the ice north, uh, it's leaving open water behind. That open water uh, has got uh, very, very cold air blowing over it, and that cold air is freezing and creating more ice. And that's why we're seeing these significant increases. And they are significant. This is three to four days per year over a 30-year period. So that means in this period here, we're actually talking about two to three months of the year when there is a lot less ice in that region than there was 30 years ago. And here we're looking at increases of three to four days per year over a long period of time. So we're seeing very, very significant periods of time, again, two or three months a year where there is ice in this region uh, where, it didn't, where it didn't used to be. And around the rest of Antarctica, it's a little bit patchy. It's a little bit blue, it's a little bit red in different areas, just depending on, uh, on, uh, on, on the winds that um, were, uh, or the trend in the wind, uh, which is much less. So, um, warmer northerlies, less sea ice, colder southerlies, more sea ice. I've talked a fair bit, and so what I thought I would do is show you a video of some under ice footage. Um, I should have set this to a lovely piece of classical music, uh, but I didn't. But um, I'll talk a little bit, um, but otherwise I'll just let you watch. This is footage taken by a remotely operated vehicle uh, by Klaus Miners, who's one of our um, colleagues here in Hobart. Uh, you can just see looming in the distance the hole where the instrument was deployed and the tether that's um, uh, attached to the, the vehicle to make sure we don't lose it. You can see the algae, the discoloration here under the ice, and you can see the changing light levels under the ice um, as a result of changes in ice thickness and changes in the snow cover. If you were standing on the surface of this flow, this is looking straight up now as the vehicle is being lowered. If you were on the surface, it would just look like a white flow. But when you've got this, the light behind it, you can see that these flows are made up of lots of component parts. So at some point, the ice has been all um, roughed up and damaged by wind and waves, and then eventually it, it's refrozen. <clears throat> 
This is some footage of pressure ridges in Antarctica. And the fascinating thing here is even right off in the, the distance there and here, this is probably 10 to 15 metres below the surface. And yet each of the individual blocks of ice is no more than, say, uh, 10 or 20 centimetres. And so at some point, there was a relatively uniform, thin cover of sea ice about that thick. And then some giant, uh, ginormous storm has come through and just completely um, deformed it. It's pushed one ice flow up on top of another and then up on top of another and created, created these enormous rubble fields. This is again looking straight up, which is why you can see that the sun through the ice. Um, it's a, a bit of a, a rubble field, but you'll just start to be able to see some krill. There's some krill there, in there as well. Um, you've got a few swimming around here. And you remember I showed earlier in the presentation a slide that showed the algae under the ice, but also that it's, it's a really important habitat for um, a lot of wildlife. And these are juvenile krill. They're a couple of centimetres long. They've got plenty to eat in here. Um, it's also much safer in here than uh, in the open water where they, they might be able to be eaten. And this is just some final footage uh, from the remotely operated vehicle. And this is of another vehicle that we've been using. This is a vehicle that's um, uh, been operated by Guy Williams, who also is based uh, here in Hobart. This is the hull of the Aurora Australis. This is the propeller and the rudder of the Aurora. And this is um, the, just the hole where the vehicle has been deployed. Uh, this vehicle has uh, quite a lot of sophisticated sensors on it. And one of the most valuable things it's done is to give us some footage of, or some data uh, on sea ice thickness. Uh, I won't talk too much about this. This just shows um, uh, different maps from under the ice that have been collected um, that um, uh, give us a good idea about how ice thickness is changing uh, on, on fairly small scales, but it's provided some great insights into just how thick the sea ice can be. Um, we, for a long time, have been peering over the side of ships, wondering how thick the ice is. Uh, we're now starting to get fantastic footage uh, and data from uh, more sophisticated technology and equipment that's um, uh, starting to reveal these questions. And the more of this information we can get, the better capability we'll have in the long run for observing whether or not the thickness of the ice is changing as well as the extent. Um, I'm nearly finished. This is a plot that shows, uh, again, how uh, wind speed has been increasing and uh, not surprisingly, when you increase the wind speed, you also increase the speed at which the sea ice drifts. Um, when you have uh, that convergence that I was talking about that drives deformation, you see an increase in convergence. And again, this is over the period of the, the satellite record. Um, and we see increases in ice volume as a result of increases in ice ridging. But most of that ridging is happening in the thick ice. Uh, the ice, which is one to two metres thick, stays basically the same. And so this is um, a very nice little model result that gives us some insights into the potential effects on the thickness of Antarctic sea ice as a result of increasing winds. We don't have the data to ground truth this and know whether or not this is actually happening. Uh, we do have better satellite technology for looking at sea ice thickness now than we've ever had before. It's a fascinating new area uh, for us to consider and perhaps not the best news tonight for some of our colleagues um, who have to drive ships in Antarctica because uh, it is quite likely based on this result that if we see stronger winds and more wind convergence that we may actually see thicker ice as well. Um, there's never uh, any escape from um, local effects. Most of what I've talked about tonight is very much about uh, what's happening at a hemispheric scale. But of course, if you're driving a ship to Antarctica, um, there's always going to be local effects that no model can predict and no amount of luck can avoid. 
Um, for example, uh, just south of Tasmania is the area where uh, Douglas Mawson established his huts in 1911. Uh, he was able to get a ship right into this part of uh, uh, Commonwealth Bay and, and, um, and set up camp there. Uh, there's actually ferocious winds uh, that funnel from uh, south to north and usually blow all of this ice to the north. They're called catabatic winds. If you've ever read any of the stories of Mawson's ex expedition, you would know that he just described it as the windiest place on earth and he's not far wrong. Um, however, uh, the outline that you can see here is an iceberg with uh, the name B09B. Uh, this is an iceberg that broke off a long way away from the Ross Ice Shelf many years ago, and it's slowly been drifting around the coast, and every so often it runs into shallow water, and it grounds, and it sits there for a year or two, and then it'll move a little bit more, and it'll ground again, and it'll sit there for a year or two. At the moment, it's decided to park itself right north of Mawson's hut, and as a result, uh, this is the actual coastline here, but the whole area between the coast and the iceberg is just full of sea ice. And that sea ice will just stay there and it'll get thicker and thicker. Um, and, you know, it may be several years before any of that area breaks out again. Uh, so if Mawson had arrived to these conditions um, in 1911, uh, I can uh, be quite certain that Mawson's huts would actually be somewhere different to where they are now. Uh, but of course, this could happen to any station. It could happen uh, to any of the, the stations that we currently have in Antarctica uh, for any of the national programs. And that's why these guys uh, have to have contingencies in place. The last slide that I was going to show is that history has other lessons as well. Uh, this data here is from an ice core. So this is an ice core actually on the Antarctic continent. And it measures effectively sea salt um, in, the, in the ice core. And uh, the, the reason that it measures sea salt and the reason that it has some bearing to the extent of sea ice is that if the further out from the coast the ice is, the less sea salt you're likely to get on the continent and to be able to measure in the ice core. And not surprisingly, well, in fact, quite surprisingly at the time, but when you look at the, the sea salt record from the core, um, it changes quite significantly from one year to the next. But I guess the surprising result here was that when you overlay the sea ice extent from the satellite record, um, there's an extraordinary um, uh, resemblance. Uh, this is only up until 2000. Mark Curran, who's here locally, again, uh, has showed me another plot today that shows actually the, the next 10 years of this uh, data actually show a slight uptick as well. And so uh, perhaps the extent increase that we're now seeing in the satellite data uh, is also being seen in the ice core data. The other record here, and this is from whaling uh, um, uh, observations, Bill Delamere from the Antarctic Division did a historical look at the whaling records. Um, and he plotted the noon position of whaling ships, knowing that the, the whaling ships tended to locate themselves at the ice edge. And there's this very big drop uh, here from the 1950s up until the 19, about 1980, which is the start of the satellite record. And so we see in both of these uh, proxy records that quite possibly from 1950 and before, sea ice was pretty stable for about 100 years, but between 1950 and about 1980, when we weren't looking because we didn't have satellites uh, at the time, uh, we possibly had this decline in sea ice extent that was quite significant and is seen here. And so I think perhaps one of my parting messages is that, yes, we look at the satellite data and we see that there's a a 1% increase in Antarctic sea ice extent, but the satellite data is just a moment in time. We need to also be looking at what happened before that and uh, what may uh, be ahead of us. So just to conclude, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, Antarctic sea ice extent is increasing. We know that from the satellite record, um, and there was a new maximum extent last year of, and that increase has been about 1.2% per decade. 
It's the small residual of much larger regional changes. There's no single factor responsible, but a combination of geography, wind and temperature explain most of the changes. There's high natural variability in sea ice. We've seen the enormous changes from minimum extent to maximum extent and minimum extent again. Uh, there's actually a chance that what we're observing at the moment um, is entirely part of the natural cycle. Uh, we might be seeing a 30 year period where things tick up and then we might see a 30 year period where things start to tick down. We actually don't know. We know some of the forcing behind the wind is anthropogenic, but we don't know whether or not, we can't say with absolute certainty that what we're seeing in sea ice isn't just a natural variability. We know that strong winds will lead to an increase in sea ice thickness in some regions as I described, and of course there's no escaping some of the local effects. I'll draw it to a conclusion there. Thanks very much. I'm very happy to answer some questions if anyone has any. Dr. Gales, <laughs> there's a microphone coming. Tony, would you comment on the relative influences you see of freshening surface water in the Southern Ocean and changes in snowfall on sea ice in their relative effect of the changes we're looking at compared to the wind effects and others that you've talked about? Yeah, I, I didn't put it into the talk, Nick, because I, um, um, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, and, and I know there's been some discussion in the, um, uh, in, the, in the scientific domain. What Nick's referring to is that there is, we know that, um, we know that the Antarctic ice cap is melting in places. And in particular, that melting is happening around the West Antarctica. Um, I mentioned that there's between Greenland and Antarctica, somewhere between one and two millimeters per year, a significant amount of that is running into the ocean just along here. Now, the question has been asked, and it's a very legitimate question in the, the science community, as to whether uh, the increased runoff into the ocean is uh, freshening the surface of the ocean and therefore making it easier for sea ice to form. I think the two things that um, uh, kind of, for me, suggest that it's not um, a major component of the changes we're seeing is that the fresh water is running in here, but this is the area where we're seeing a lot less sea ice for a start. Um, so the only other explanation could be that if this water was being, um, you know, drifting along the coast or being advected along the coast, there is uh, a surface current that moves in this direction and perhaps that fresh water would be ending up in this area where we're seeing this significant increase. Again, uh, I'm not an oceanographer, but my expectation is that you'd see enough mixing along that pathway that it wouldn't be a major factor either. Um, if there's an oceanographer in the room that would uh, care to uh, contradict me or um, offer a more insightful answer, I'm more than happy. No? Nope. Okay. <laughs> that may just mean there's no oceanographers in the room. <laughs> Hi, Siobhan. There's some evidence for New Zealanders have found some fresh water just underneath the sea ice in, along, the, along that Victoria Lang coast. And there's also some evidence that the, the that people measuring in the Ross Sea have found, found some evidence of freshening and whether that's coming from the Ross ice shelf or whether it's coming from the West Antarctic. Yeah. Um, there's been some measurements and obviously they, they, they think it's um, from Delta 18, but it's, but it's coming from the Antarctic right. rather than from precipitation. So, right. so there's obviously some freshening going on, mm. but whether that's enough to be causing sea ice, that's, yeah. those, those are still questions. Yeah. Are so I, I completely agree that, that, you know, that there, has to be, whoop, there has to be freshening going on. In fact, we've got measurements of that. Um, Steve Rintoul, who's uh, an oceanographer with us, I mentioned the, the observations we've been doing back to 1991 um, he, um, uh, he, those observations not only show that the Southern Ocean is warming, they also, also show that the Southern Ocean is freshening. 
and they also show that the Southern Ocean is becoming more acidic. So we know that CO2 is being absorbed by the ocean and we can measure that in the pH. Um, so th those observations are, um, are sustained over decades now. So there's, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we know that's happening. Yeah, Stephen tools are, are in, in the deep water. There's some of these freshening signals are, are closer to the surface. Correct. So, so, yeah. so, so the, 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 there's something there, but it's, I don't think it's enough to be causing, causing this signal. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and, the, and the models, of course, unfortunately mix, have too much mixing in them. So, but but the, it, it would be a case of seeing what sort of mixing process is going yeah. on. Yeah, thanks. Has there been any has there been any indication of a change in the cloud cover over the lands around that area? For instance, I have relatives in Canada farming in Manitoba, and the uh, changes of direction of the winds there have changed the the uh, cloud cover, and they're giving up uh, growing grain because they can't get it right ripe, and they need the sun to ripen it. Mm. Yeah. Um, is there anyone here that is a more expert in clouds? I can give you a, a general answer. Clouds are one of the more difficult things to, uh, to measure uh, over the Southern Ocean. We have satellites to do it now, but over the Southern Ocean, um, there's, there's very few observations except at some of the coastal stations uh, around Antarctica. Um, one of the most important things that we could do to improve climate models is to get cloud processes much more accurate than we currently have them. Mm -hmm. Now, whether there's changes in the cloud climatology, I actually I can't answer that question. And if anyone in the room can, I'd be more than happy for you to, to speak up. Um, but it, it stands to reason if, you, if you're changing the wind field, um, if, you're, uh, if you've got more or less moisture in the atmosphere as a result of those changes in the wind, then you would expect to see changes in clouds. Anyone? Who can I point to? Just for the um, purpose of people what, online. What are the challenges arising out of these changes for us? Are, are we going to freeze to death? Are we going to be blown off the, the island or what? Um, well, no. No and no. Um, the challenges in the context of this talk were more about operations uh, in Antarctica because that's the, the subject of our workshop for the next two days. We've brought together scientists from around the world with uh, the operators of national Antarctic programs uh, who are grappling with the impact on their logistics operations of a changing sea ice environment. And that's, that's the, the, the topic that, that we'll be covering in the workshop. I think the, uh, the challenges... Uh, from, a, uh, from a societal perspective, in terms of a small increase in um, sea ice uh, around Antarctica is, is not going to have any impact on your daily life. Has an impact on my daily life. <laughs> I don't know if we have a mechanism to get questions from the next room. Um, if, if there's anyone in there, <laughs> they might have all gone home, who knows? Uh, sorry? No questions? Okay. Going once, going twice. All right, thank you very much, everyone.